It means the large flat plain. And he looked at it and said, this is good for farming. And it has plentiful game in it. We shall hunt game and we will be happy here and we'll set up villages and farms. You see there were already people here who were hunting and farming. And we set up villages and farms also. And our young people were there and our wigwams. And we were very happy. And so we in the Cherokee already were here in spite of what Boone was told or what Boone told other people. Now this is not to say that those people who came with Boone and Boone himself were not brave people. Boone was a very brave man. And those who followed him believed what he said and followed him without knowing where they were going or what they were going to see. They did not know what they were going to farm or farm to find, perhaps they were going to find death, but they came anyway. Afterwards. And so you see, they came to this land and they intended to set up their villages. Now those of us that were here and were already farming, we farm primarily three crops. Those that we call the three sisters. Do you have brothers or sisters at home? Do you have chores? And we'll tell you what you should do with the chores. Because you see, those crops called the three sisters are corn, beans, and squash. The corn, beans, and pumpkin. And so you plant the corn first, and it grows to be about knee high. And then you plant the beans next to it. And it climbs around the stalk of the corn. And then when it started, you plant the squash. And it has large leaves. And when we decide to go to war, the young men meet in the council house. There's plenty of seats down here, folks. The men meet in the council house, and they will beat upon their chest, and they will tell stories of great deeds that they will do in war. And they will get themselves to a high state of emotion and they will be ready to take their tomahawks and run out of the council house and strike the war post and go on the war path but before they go they invite in several of the elder women of the tribe of the nation and they have the final say in spite of all the men voting to go to war, two elder women can say no. In your language, in your language, you would say they have the final veto. Now this is 1775. Boone has just come across the mountains in that white culture beside the great water. Can women vote? Can women own property? Can they inherit property? Can they make business decisions? Well, you see, my, my nation is much more progressive than yours. Or perhaps at some time your nation has decided to borrow some of these features from mine and from other native cultures. So you see, maybe there are not as many differences between us as you may have at first assumed. Because we have been called barbarians. We have been called savages. Engines. Anything else? Redskins. Okay, so when you call us that, that makes us somewhat less than you. And maybe that justifies being able to treat us not so fairly. But let's look at this village life. Young men would sooner or later have to become warriors. Am I not right? Now first you must learn how to hunt with a bow and arrow. Because you cannot be trusted with a firelock until you can stalk game with a bow and arrow. I think you should volunteer to come right up here. You can leave your 
path, I think. Now the first thing we're going to do with you when it's time for you to become a warrior is we're going to turn you over to the women. And they will take two clamshells, bend your head, and they will pluck all your hair out down to this much. They're going to give me a scalp lock. And you will have a scalp lock. And what that says is, when I become a warrior, you want to take my scalp? Here it is. Come get it. And so they will do that. And they will pluck out all the other hair in your body, on your body, too. Now just be quiet and wait. <laughs> now the next thing they're going to do, is they're going to take a very sharp knife. Look that way. <laughs> and they are going to take his ear. And they will cut away the outer portion of his ear. So that it is attached at the bottom and at the top. And they will wrap copper wire around that ear loop. So that it is heavy and it droops down. And then they will hang earrings in it to make it heavier yet. And it will droop more. And if it droops all the way to your shoulders, wow. You're a very good looking warrior. <laughs> Just like me. <laughs> but what happens when he runs through the woods? Catches. He might snag his ears. And so we will take a bright red ribbon, we will tie them back behind your head so that they do not snag. But see, when you become older like me, you've gone through many winters. And the blood does not flow very well through that outer ear rim and it gets frostbitten, and so you lose the outer ear ring. And so sometimes, if you see pictures of old warriors, they look like they might have small ears. It's because they've lost the outer ear ring. But we go ahead and repuncture them and put in more ear rings. You may sit down. Thank you. I just had a scalp Very good. Okay. My talk time. <laughs> so you see, the young ladies had responsibilities. They would be growing up to determine where the home would be, where the farm would be. Young men had responsibilities that they had to grow into. Sounds like most any society. But you see, we fought. Because if you come home and you find somebody a cook fire in your yard, or they are sleeping in your bed, they've eaten your dog, would you not fight? So you see, you see, we fought also. Because we could not understand this concept that I mentioned earlier of property. The white man says, I will own this property. He takes his axe. And he goes out among the trees, and he has a much bigger axe than this tech, tech hawk. And he puts blaze marks on the trees. That means he chops away the bark and leaves a white spot on the tree. And it shows up for a long distance down through the woods. And he will walk for many days, perhaps towards the star that does not move in the sky. And he will put another blaze mark on the tree. And then he will turn towards the rising sun, walk again, another blaze mark, turn back towards the direction that has warmer weather, another blaze mark, and end up finally back where he started. Then he will take that paper that you make talking leaves out of, and he will draw a picture of what he just did. And he can take that to another white man and say, this is my property. And he means, this is my property here in this land. And you Indians stay out of it. How can you own property? How can you own the earth? It's no different than trying to own the air that you breathe. Or own the water that you drink. Someday, a white man will try to sell you water to drink. So you see, our concept was different. We did not understand this property. The white women in those villages cried for joy when it was made public. I chose wisely that time. The Americans won the war. But 
you see, the Americans met with the British to decide, decide who would go and who would stay and what would be done with the Indians. But did they invite the native tribes? Once again, no. And so they decided how it would be and where the borders would be. But we had our three reservations, and other nations had reservations in Ohio and Indiana and Michigan also. <coughs> and they, in their own ways, each one decided how they would meet the requirements of this new government. We were successful. These people called Quakers came in and helped us to run the mills. They did not try to convert us. The Shawnee Nation especially was not willing to convert to this thing called Christianity. Why you, you Christians, you once met your Savior and you killed Him. So why should we convert? We believe in the Creator. And we believe, as I told your Jefferson, the same Creator who created me created you. And He expects us to treat each other fairly. Now in your terms, how much more Christian a belief can that be? And so the Quakers said they have met the requirements. They've been very effective with their reservations in Ohio. And we lived there for many years. And I moved into a two-story cabin near the town that is today called St. John's. And in 1828, the Jackson administration moved into Washington. And they told us that to save you from the white men who live near you and keep them from cheating you, we will move you west of the, of the uh, Mississippi, the father of water, and that all Indians must go. Even those who had met the requirements, even those who were citizens, this United States. I did not sign that agreement. But many of the elders in my villages did. So I said, then I will make sure they get moved. And between 1828 and 1831, I'm now 108 years old. And in 31, I will be 111 years old. I made sure that my people moved safely to this place you call Kansas. But I said to the Indian agents, give me three things. A gristmill, a sawmill, and a blacksmith. And we will be good citizens, and we will farm, and we will be good neighbors. And so we moved. And so you see, I did not know this place, so I returned to my home in, near Wapakoneta and went back to my cabin. But when I got there, there were no young people playing in the yard. My young men were gone. They had gone to set up farms in Kansas. And my family was not there. And you see, the Great Spirit came to me and said, I know you are very tired, Black Hood. And it's time for you to leave this earth. And that was the end.